close to my heart and ought to be the focus of informed debate in our country. Since my student days, I have been working on problems facing our agrarian economy in a larger global context. The labor of peasant smallholders, sharecroppers, and agricultural laborers form the bedrock of our national economy, and their well-being should exercise the minds of the people's representatives and policy makers. The agrarian situation in India, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, in one word, is grim. Boasting a rate of high GDP growth, the economic survey acknowledges that the agricultural output has grown at a rate of just over 1% last year. The terms of trade against agriculture are clear since the year 2011. The finance minister acknowledged in his budget speech that of the five major challenges facing India today, the first and foremost is the stress on agricultural incomes. Yet his government has shown no real commitment to address that challenge. In replying to the debate on the land acquisition bill, the Rural Development Minister said in a tone of complaint that the agricultural sector accounted for nearly 55% of employment in our country and contributed less than 15% of our GDP. While it is imperative to create non-farm employment, it was extraordinary to find a farmer's son and grandson casting aspersions on the majority of the working population in our land and wishing that pe peasants and agricultural laborers would not resist land grabbing by this government's corporate friends and allies. We must not deride small farms. Very often, they are more efficient than large farms, even though we need to address the problem of self-exploitation of unpaid women's and children's labor on families. Of course, we side by farmers. My friend, Sri Karunakaran, has given some startling figures in the course of his speech. Cotton cultivators in Maharashtra or Gujarat and sugar cult cultivators in Karnataka seek subsistence via the market. They need favorable prices and credit for their cash crops in order to command access to food. Tens of millions of peasants in our country live on the borderline of life and death. They suffer from chronic malnutrition and hunger. Now, there have been unseasonable rains that have affected crops in six northern states. But we must always remember that we are facing not a problem of nature, but a problem of political economy. It is not just droughts or floods or monsoon failures that adversely affect the odds of life of our peasantry. Our British colonial masters, led by Lord Curzon, used to try and pass off uh, man-made catastrophes as acts of God. But we know in Bengal that the Great Famine of 1770 or 1943 were man-made famines. And our great economists like Ramesh Dutt always pointed out that the food supply in India as a whole had never failed, failed. But the people were so resourceless, so absolutely without any savings, that when crops failed in one area, they were unable to buy food from neighboring provinces rich in harvests. We must learn from our great economic thinkers and not from our colonial masters. Our agricultural sector is beset with problems of reduced cultivated area and low yields. Our primary producers are caught within the meshes of iniquitous and interlinked product and credit markets. How can we turn things around? Let me suggest some policy measures that must be taken to tackle the challenges of both agricultural production and distribution. Talk about the second green revolution in our country has been confined to the realm of rhetoric and has not been transformed into practical policy. We need more public investment in agricultural science and research as well as extension services to educate our farmers about best practices. At most 40% of our cultivated area has irrigation of any kind. Our focus should be on micro-irrigation projects that will provide rural employment in the short run while increasing productivity in the longer term. We need environmentally sound watershed management. In the 1980s, in my own state of West Bengal, the indiscriminate digging of tube wells compounded the problem of arsenic poisoning in groundwater. The current government's Jolbharo Jolbharo program has been 
more far-sighted and successful. The central government's Krishi Sinchai Jojana should learn some lessons from Mamata Banerjee's West Bengal. The problem of peasant debt has two aspects. First, the peasantry needs to be freed from extortionate interest rates charged by Mahajans and Saukars. Second, primary producers need access to adequate credit at right moments of the production cycle. The finance minister has set an ambitious target of rupees 8.5 lakh crores of farm credit during 2015-2016. Unfortunately, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, institutional credit from banks hardly ever reaches smallholding peasants and gets cornered by richer farmers and by agricultural corporations. Better targeting of agricultural credit is an urgent necessity. The peasants never get a remunerative price for their produce as traders and middlemen in the agricultural marketing chain siphon off the profits. The solution being offered by this government is the creation of a national agricultural market. My own considered view is that this problem should be addressed in the first instance at the local and regional levels. Let me give the example of the rural areas of my own constituency, Jadavpur, to illustrate the needs and the available best practices. Nearly 80% of the holdings in Baruipur, Shonarpur, and Bhangur, rural areas of my constituency, are less than one hectare in size. The cropping intensity is 165%. In addition to rice, approximately 20% of the cultivated area is devoted to the production of fruits and vegetables of very high quality. They are mostly sold in local markets. In Baruipur, there is only one cold storage facility with a capacity of 1,200 metric tons, which is not sufficient to cater the need, to the needs of the peasants of the region. Moreover, even this facility is not equipped to store fresh fruits and vegetables. This one large facility needs to be upgraded with the help of central schemes to make it fit for storing fresh fruits and vegetables. Mini cold storage units ranging from 5 to 30 metric tons need to be set up all over the country for groups of small and marginal peasants. On a more optimistic note, let me mention one positive development in Bhangor, another rural area in my constituency. With the support of the West Bengal State's Horticulture Department, a Bhangor Vegetable Producers Company Limited has been established with a membership of 1,750 marginal peasants, all owning less than one hectare each. And this company now has a paid up capital of 7.3 lakhs of rupees. And it is a federation of 100 small peasant interest groups. The company has improved access to inputs and finance, enhanced productivity by promoting better agricultural practices, helped peasants undertake value-adding activities like grading and packaging at the village level, and provided marketing support. As a result, per hectare crop output has increased dramatically from 7,500 kg to 9,500 kg, and average peasants' income has risen from rupees 22,000 in 140 days to rupees 88,000 in 120 days. This local example of West Bengal has much wider relevance for small and marginal peasants all over the country. The railways, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, can play an innovative role in agricultural marketing, and I hope that the Agriculture Minister and the Railway Minister will discuss this matter. I have seen how small peasants come to Shonarpur and Baruipur railway stations to sell their produce. Instead of complaining about squatters on railway land, the railways can redesign land owned by them near stations of B and C level towns to revolutionize the marketing of agricultural produce by small peasants. The railways can address problems of overcrowding, retail, intermodal transport needs, absence of public space through affordable, intelligent design and by openness to market-oriented small peasants, producers from the agrarian hinterland of these small towns. In addition to creating cold storage facilities for agricultural produce, this government should put something else into deep cold storage for all time to come in the interests of India's Kisans and Khet Mazdoors. This is the ill-conceived land acquisition bill that was railroaded through this Lok Sabha. 
I am taking my stand not on 1970s style populism that Sri Arun Jaitley referred to in his reply uh, at the end of the budget debate. I am taking my stand on the need for a balanced and harmonious 21st century economy that guarantees a fair deal for the underprivileged in our quest for rapid growth and development. Land acquisition from farmers in our great democracy must be based on consent, not coercion, on compensation, not expropriation, and it must be for public purpose, not private profit. So it is incumbent, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, on this government to provide equity in both senses of the term. Equity in the sense of fairness and justice, as well as equity in the form of an ownership stake in the projects on acquired land whenever land is taken away from our peasants by opening bank accounts, from taking away jandhan in the form of agricultural land and handing it over to corporate houses on the false pretext of public purpose. Genuine fairness and transparency, the two words that were in the title of the bill that was passed in this House, demand nothing else. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, on behalf of my party, let me urge this House to rise to its full stature and make sure that peasants, agricultural laborers, and a range of service providers in rural areas be made partners and not victims in India's development story. Thank you very much. Thank you.